I talk a lot about just the general need to improve scientific literacy in the country. That's a 10 or 20 year project, though. That's not something I have a, an idea for overnight. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CyberWire's Hacking Humans podcast. This is the show where each week we look behind the social engineering scams, phishing schemes, and criminal exploits that are making headlines and taking a heavy toll on organizations around the world. I'm Dave Bittner from the CyberWire, and joining me is Joe Kerrigan from the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute. Hello, Joe. Hi, Dave. We've got some fun stories to share, and later in the show, we've got my interview with Dave Levitan. He's author of the book, Not a Scientist, How Politicians Mistake, Misrepresent, and Utterly Mangle Science. But first, a quick word from our sponsors at Know Before. So how do you train people to recognize and resist social engineering? There are some things people think. Test them, and if they fall for a test scam, fire them. Or other people say, if someone flunks the test, shame them. Instead of employee of the month, it's doofus of the day. Or maybe you pass out a gift card to the one who gets the A-plus for skepticism in the face of phishing. So how about it? What do you think? Carrots or sticks? What would you do? Later in the show, we'll hear what the experts at Know Before have to say. They're the sponsors of this show. And we are back. Joe, I'm going to kick things off this week. I've got a story. This actually came to us from a listener. His name is Steven. He says, good evening, Dave Bittner and Joe Kerrigan. Hey, that's us. That is. Hi, Steven. <laughs> he says, love the Hacking Humans podcast, and I think I found a good one for you. My girlfriend was checking her email from her phone, and this one popped up from what looked like her bank. She's been listening to me talk about your podcast and had the forethought of questioning this email because she didn't know the person mentioned in it. Hmm. After checking it out from our computer, we could see the links. Needless to say, I had her forward it to me for your show. Thanks for all the great advice. Keep up the good work. And he describes himself as being a careful clicker. Well, good for you, Stephen. So the email here, this comes from uh, BMO Wealth Management. So this is an investment company. Mm -hmm. And it says, you have a new e-document. Hmm. And it says, the Interact e-transfer you sent to Patrick Johnson, and it has an email address, right. has been approved. The transfer is now complete. Thank you for using our e-transfer service. If you did not initiate this transaction, we recommend that you go to, and then there's a link that says manage, manage cancel, cancel transaction. <laughs> right. So what do you think is going on here, Joe? Well, I'll, I'll bet this link is not uh, not a good link. I'll bet it's a malicious link. Yes, absolutely. So this is a standard thing where they're, they're impersonating the bank and trying to get you to go somewhere else and use your login credentials. But obviously, you know, the call to action here is that the money transfer has already gone through. Right, right? exactly. <laughs> that's the hook that's supposed to short circuit your thinking there. That right. The money's already gone from your account, but you can get it back if you click on this link right here. <laughs> that's right. Time, oh, let me click on the link. Time's a wasting. Right. Time's a wasting. Yeah. And and this looks like something that would come from a bank. This it, looks, there's everything does. about this looks legitimate. It has all of the fine print and things you would expect from something that would come from a bank. There's mm -hmm. a 1 800 number here, all the normal things. So at first glance, this certainly looks like a legit piece of communication from a bank. But uh, I think a good thing to point out here that uh, Stephen pointed out was that his girlfriend checked this on her phone first. Right. But then they went to the computer. And it was a little easier to find the scam. Right. And this is, we've said this before about one of the problems with phone interfaces is that they don't have the real estate to show you these kind of things. Right. That, that a computer uh, interface does uh, yeah. simply because of size. A phone has to be something that fits in your pocket and your computer does not. Right. I know, for example, uh, like I'm an iOS guy and right. I know there is a way that you can click on a link without clicking through and have iOS reveal what the link is. Mm -hmm. And I don't recall off the top of my head what that is, but it's quick enough to Google that. So if that's something you're interested in finding out, I suspect Android probably has a similar... Way yeah. to do that as well. I don't know. I've never actually had the need to do it because yeah. I just tend to delete emails. <laughs> yeah. Well, but, I mean, but that's the thing is that it, it's not that it's impossible to do right. on a mobile device. It's just, it's just it's a lot difficult. harder. <laughs> there are more steps. It makes the process additionally harder. So people are not going to do it. Yeah. And that's why these scams are going to be successful, particularly in the mobile domain. Yeah. Well, good for you, Stephen. Good for your girlfriend for uh, paying attention to this, handing it over to you. And uh, thanks to both of you for sending it in to us. So yep. that is my story for this week. Joe, what do you have for us? 
Dave, my story comes from a company called Fidus Information Security in England. Mm. They're an info security company. They have a blog, and there's a blog entry here. It doesn't give an author, but I'm going to guess that the guy's name is Andrew. But it's called Turning the Tables on a Virgin Media Twitter Scammer. Okay. This person is a customer of Virgin Media, yeah. which is, I guess, like a cable provider in England. Right, yeah. But he's complaining mm-hmm. about service. And Virgin Media actually goes ahead and responds to him like like most legitimate companies do, saying, go ahead and send us a direct message or a DM and, and we'll get this fixed. But somebody else slides right into his DMs with a message and he accepts the message coming in and it's from a spoofed account. It's uh, at Virgin SC Media. Hmm. Right. So it looks very similar. And if you recall, we had Sam Smith talking about this very thing going on yeah. uh, a couple of weeks ago where Twitter users, Twitter scammers are out there impersonating these companies trying to provide tech support. And it's pretty easy to see where this goes because the very first message is, hi there, what's your full name and address linked to your account so we can help you further this process? And then it's signed with a carrot and a BP. Okay. Right. So the guy looks at the account. He know, He's a security engineer. So he knows immediately this is a fake account. So he figures it's time to have some fun. <laughs> right? All right. So what does he do? You see, he goes... Of course. It's in my brother's name, Wade Wilson, and he gives an address, <laughs> a London address. Uh, do you know who Wade Wilson is? I do not. It Who's... is uh, Deadpool. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. The guy goes, thanks for the information, Andrew. Please allow me a minute to look up your account. <laughs> right? So then the scammer sends a, a next message, and here's the hook. He says, before we proceed, for security purpose of your account, please provide the card number expiration date, CSC, cardholder name linked to the Virgin Media account. <laughs> if you don't have access to this card, it can be any card registered to the address. Oh, wow. Well, right. that's convenient. Isn't that convenient? <laughs> yes, that's right. right. So, so this, this guy's just <laughs> harvesting credit cards yeah. is what he's trying to do. It, wow. It, he needs all this information to verify an account? I don't think so. No. You know, usually these accounts should have pins on them. So he actually gives him a uh, gives him a credit card account that looks legitimate and tells him it's an American Express credit card. Yeah. And he gets the account information from PayPal for their web integration. They have these these sample credit card numbers that aren't valid, but they look like they're valid. Oh, I see. So if right. you run some processing on it, it'll process as a valid card number. Uh-huh. But when you actually submit it, it, it won't wind up getting submitted. I see. Uh, right? Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. So the scammer says, thanks, that card is registered under the same address too, and, and Andrew says it is. And then the scammer is looking for a, an access code that comes through because he's, again, trying to get some some confirmation for it because he's actually trying to go ahead and process something right now and get a payment sent. Uh-huh. And Andrew is saying, I don't have it, but here's a link they sent me. Now, this link is Andrew's link, right? He, it's, a, it's a link to a website that Andrew has set up. He's trying to capture the IP address of the scammer. Oh, okay. So it's actually a trap. Way to go, Andrew. Right. Yeah. So he goes round and round trying to get him to click on it and then he says, "No, I can't. I can't see anything. It's I'm getting a, I'm getting an error." And eventually he sends a faked Cloudflare error, 522 error, oh. which is an HTTP error. You can look up the code. I don't know what it means, but yeah. um, he says, "I can't get it to work. Here's the link." And eventually somebody does click on the link and they get an IP address, but it's not the IP address they're looking. It says it was linked back to their website, and they never received any replies back after they huh. got them to click on the link. Wow. So the scammer was ultimately un- unsuccessful, and what FIDUS Security did was they reported the account, and Twitter has since suspended it. Congratulations, FIDUS. You're, you're, my, uh, <laughs> you're my hero this week. <laughs> yeah, waste, wasted some of their time. Wasted some of their time, wrecked one of their accounts, and yep. and tried to get them to give away their location. That's that's a win. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm very happy with this. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, uh, it's time to move on to our catch of the day. Our catch of the day comes from a listener named Lars, and uh, Lars sent this in. He said, hi, I got this in my email, which I thought might be interesting for catch of the day for your podcast. I think the tone of the email threatening with bodily harm is quite unique. Hmm. The language in the mail is, of course, hardly English, so it would make a fun read for the guys. Hmm. That's us again. It is us. Yeah. <laughs> so here it is. It, uh, it goes something like this. Greetings. I've got a private web page that includes all sorts of offerings that I give in Darknet. Just about anything from totally ruining someone's business to physical injury and so forth. Nevertheless, absolutely nothing critical like getting rid of. 
Generally, it is stuff similar to declined relationships or rivalry on the job. Anyways, I have been reached this week by customer to make an arrangement and also object is obviously you, in a immediate and painless manner. The thing is, I only get money just after each completely finished job, and so I decided to make contact with you before to be able to pay me for being inactive which I frequently proffer the target. Assuming I don't obtain what I'm asking, my executor will carry out the request. Yet if I will generate an agreement, besides eliminating the order, you are going to receive whole details concerning the client that I have found. As soon as the request is finished, I often remove the operator as well. Consequently, I have got a choice to generate 1200 via you, in essence with no efforts, or get 4k through the purchaser, but to get rid of my operator. I am obtaining transfers just through Bitcoin. Here's my Bitcoin address. You now have 24 hours to balance transfer. Wow. <laughs> what does this mean? <laughs> well, I have no clue. Is this guy saying that somebody is paying him four grand to beat me up, but I no, can buy him off hit, for 12? No, it's a hitman. No, it's a hitman. Hit, yeah, he's going to take you out, Joe, oh. or this person. Yeah, this is a hitman. This is this is serious business. Oh, okay. And what I- See, what, I didn't even get that. You know, first of all, I think this is a badly translated. This has been run through the Google Translate back and forth several times. My take on this is that what this person is saying is I've been hired to- with for a hit on on the person they're targeting right and uh, but my usual mo is after i do the hit i also take out the person who hired me to do the hit oh, okay is after that... i get the money yeah right. so this way if it's easier on me for the low low price of $1200 i won't take you out i'll even give you the information on who ordered your hit and they're trying to say this is someone from your work or it's a rival at your work or right. or someone that you uh, – uh, perhaps a romance that went bad or something like that. I see. So. I see. Yeah, this is starting to make sense because there's a <laughs> sentence in here that says, or nevertheless, absolutely nothing critical like getting rid of, which means that he doesn't do – Wet work, getting rid of people, right? I yeah, I guess yeah. Nevertheless, absolutely nothing criminal. Like getting, yeah, hmm. We don't know. Yeah, this is so badly worded. <laughs> <laughs> well, but then later, later he says in an immediate and painless manner. So, right, that to me seems you know two to the back of the head or something. Right, I don't, but that's I don't know. That's a sentence in this thing. This is so terrible. It's it is. awful. I mean, it I, is. I would like to look at this Bitcoin address and see if anybody has sent anything to it. <laughs> it's a good idea. Well, you know, I think the legitimacy of this was certainly hurt by the broken English here. Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, good for our listener, Lars, for uh, laughing it off and, and thanks for sending it in to us. Unfortunately, I can imagine there are versions of this that I have seen that are much more impressive. That, right. That's better worded. Better worded. I'm sure more... this is absolutely terrifying for someone to get. Yeah. Yeah. You find the right person and this could be really, really terrifying, right. as you say. So it's a horrible thing. This particular incarnation of it is kind of funny and silly because mm -hmm. of all the wording. But uh, yeah, this, this, uh, it's, a, it's a tough one. Now, I'm no expert in organized crime, Dave, but I think that, um, <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> that $4,000 is a little cheap for a hit. I mean, I would think, yeah, that's a good, that's a good point. I hadn't thought about that. And also I would mm. think it difficult for a hitman who kills the people who hire him to get repeat business. That's true. His, his Yelp reviews would probably be pretty, <laughs> pretty, pretty low. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Lars, for sending it into us. That is our catch of the day. Coming up next, we've got my interview with Dave Levitin. He's the author of the book, Not a Scientist, How Politicians Mistake, Misrepresent, and Utterly Mangle Science. But first, a quick word from our sponsors at Know Before. Let's return to our sponsor, Know Before's question. Carrots or sticks? Stu Showerman, Know Before's CEO, is definitely a carrot man. You train people, he argues, in order to build a healthy security culture. And sticks don't do that. Approach your people like the grown-ups they are, and they'll respond. Learning how to see through social engineering can be as much fun as learning how a conjuring trick works. Hear more of Stu's perspectives in Know Before's weekly Cyber Heist News. We read it, and we think you'll find it valuable, too. Sign up for Cyber Heist News at knowbefore.com news. That's K-N-O-W-B-E, the number four, dot com slash news. 
Joe, I had the opportunity recently to speak with Dave Levitin. He's the author of the book, Not a Scientist, How Politicians Mistake, Misrepresent, and Utterly Mangle Science. Really interesting stuff here in these days of fake news and politicians trying to influence to believe things, uh, alternative facts, and so on. Really interesting read. So here's my conversation with Dave Levitin. Once I decided to call the book this, I started sort of going back into the history of it a little bit. People are familiar with it you know, these days to do with climate change almost entirely. And, you know, it sort of was very popular in in sort of the 2009, 10, 11 range, I guess. Before that, uh, it actually was used a lot longer ago. The first example I could find was Ronald Reagan in 1980, just before the presidential election. And he was, I mean, climate change was not quite the issue it is now then, but he was talking about sort of a similar issue. He was talking about acid rain and sulfur dioxide emissions instead of carbon dioxide emissions. And he used it almost in exactly the same same way that you hear people use it now. You know, he said, I'm not a scientist, and then followed that up by saying something dramatically unscientific. (laughs) And so what's the ploy here? What's the misdirection that these folks are using to kind of get you off the trail? I actually have... uh answer that question in sort of multiple ways over, over the last couple of years. Yeah. Um, I, I sort of changed my mind almost on exactly what it's doing. I think the main thing is just to sort of set science off as unknowable almost to make it seem like the the real answer is not even feasible to know <laughs> that the, they're going to offer an opinion while saying you know okay I'm not an expert but here's here's the truth because the truth is actually unknowable um, and it sort of sets real scientists people who actually do the work uh, off on, on the side or in the corner as sort of nerdy, eggheady types who couldn't possibly be trusted with actually forming public policy. It strikes me that there there could be some rapport building here as well by saying to the audience, like you, I'm not a scientist. I'm just a regular person like you are. I agree. There is that. Although the, the interesting thing about that is that they don't do it for anything else, right? Mm. I mean, they don't do it for, you know, I'm not an economist. I'm not a a Middle Eastern expert. I'm not, you know, they don't, they don't, I'm not an expert in, in bridge building when they're talking about an infrastructure bill. They don't seem to do it for anything else. So it can, I mean, and most of the time, the people that they're talking to are not an expert in the thing they're talking about, right? So I've thought of that as well, that it seems like it's it puts us all on the same page, but then why wouldn't you do it for other things? Yeah, that's interesting. Take us through some of the other methods they outline in the book. I think I have a total of 12 of them, although I guess 13 if you count a, a bonus one. Some of them are pretty straightforward. Uh, maybe I'll skip over the ones that with names that, that people probably have heard of, things like the oversimplification or the cherry pick. Right. Cherry picking data is something a lot of people are probably familiar with. But some of the ones that, that I find more interesting, something like the butter up and undercut, mm. which is sort of a little bit of, of misdirection in a way. People will use this when they're talking about any sort of topic that is actually quite popular. So I think one of the examples I go through is about NASA. NASA tends to be pretty popular. People like the things that NASA does. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty hard to just trash NASA if you're a politician. It's not going to go over that well. So they'll say very nice things about the people who work at NASA and the very smart smart scientists and astronauts and everything – but there'll be like some little hidden piece of this these nice words where they're actually proposing cutting some bit of funding usually or cutting off some, you know, some avenue of research. And with NASA, it's climate research. They don't want them doing that. That one can be sort of very insidious. It's also one of the only ones I actually sort of ascribe intent to. You have to mean to do this one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it, it can't be an accident. And sometimes I try to be generous in the book with letting it be an accident, although it usually isn't. Uh, That one you really have to mean to do. Can you give us an example? So Ted Cruz, Texas senator, this was in March of 2015. There was a hearing in the Senate. He said a lot of really nice things. He said innovation has been integral to the mission of NASA. He spoke about the passion of the professionals at this fine institution. He quoted former astronauts. And then he, he started sort of making his pitch. He said, it is time once again for man to leave the safety of the harbor and further explore the deep uncharted waters of deep space. Hmm. So this all sounds very nice. Right. I'm on board (laughs) so far. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And no one who is also in favor of NASA would think, oh, Ted Cruz is, is trying to crippled some part of NASA, but he was. <laughs> the actual policy proposals that he was bringing up at this hearing cut NASA's earth science funding down to, I, I don't remember the exact levels, but he was basically trying to eliminate it. And he had some more lines about this. Should NASA focus primarily inwards or outwards beyond lower earth o- orbit? You know, he talked about disproportionate funding to, to earth science. I mean, it was 
this very sort of indirect way of saying, I'm trying to stop you from doing something which you're doing. And NASA, you know, is along with, with NOAA is one of the two main sources of, of climate science for the U.S. government. So he's right. basically trying to end that by telling us how great NASA is. <laughs> so unless you're sort of really paying attention to the details of policy proposals, these things can can get by you, you know. So it's pr- almost like a, a misdirection that a magician would use. Absolutely. Yes. It's, you know, focus on on the shiny object over here while I, you know, saw someone in half over on that side. You said, you know, you were working doing fact checking. How did you find your own experience to be? Did you get better at detecting these sorts of things? That's an interesting question. To be totally honest, a lot of the errors or, or lies, if, you know, we, if I'm going to stop being generous uh, about <laughs> science from politicians are, are not actually that hard to spot. There was a sense in that job of this sounds sort of uncharitable, but of repetitiveness. <laughs> you know, huh. people would say, I mean, the same way that this line, not a scientist, became such a, a thing. A lot of some of these other specific lines would, would really come up a lot. So it's not like it was that hard to sort of find these things. Sometimes the sort of more obscure examples would take a lot of doing. And I did probably get better at digging into to how some of these errors happen, because some of them are not as straightforward or uh, in a way, as sneaky as what Ted Cruz was da- doing hmm. there, you know, sometimes they're they're just hard to untangle, I guess. Right. So I, I I did get better at that, I would say. What's your take on the tendency for people to go for this stuff? I'm left scratching my head quite often. Like I said, you know, I pound my head on the desk when I hear someone say I'm not a scientist. But we seem to be more and more slipping into this era where there's almost a willful ignorance. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I mean, it's the kind of thing, you know, I don't think anyone has a has a particularly good answer for. I mean, mm-hmm. people have written books about, you know, the death of expertise and things like that and how we don't listen to experts anymore. I, I can't claim to have a great idea of how to fix that or, or where it comes from. There's a problem of amplification, right? I mean, people have been able to say you know, wrong things about any topic for forever. It's just that now they can they can spread much quicker and, and much more widely through a number of means. So I think maybe we notice them more. You know, I mean you you have more opportunity to slam your head on the desk <laughs> because right. because you're you're seeing them happen sort of in real time and people being willing to accept them. Again, I, I can't say I have a great answer for why they're willing to accept them. I mean, I talk a lot about just the general need to improve scientific literacy in the country. That's a 10 or 20 year project, though. That's not something I have a, an idea for overnight. But I suppose, I mean, your book could be uh, something of a guide to help people detect these sorts of things, to know and recognize when uh, politicians are, are trying to deceive them or manipulate them. Well, I hope so. I mean, that was, that was the idea, just that, you know... So, People, most of us are not experts in in these things. There can be a lot of topics that politicians talk about that are very complicated, or, or if they're not directly scientific, they might have some scientific component to them. And yeah, I mean, I I don't blame anyone for you know not being an expert on everything. So I, I think it, I hope it would help people, you know, sort of at least pay a little more attention when it seems like a politician might be trying to to get something past you. That was the idea. I I, I can't tell you how, how well it's working though. <laughs> Is your sense that, that much of this is being done out of malice or or do the folks who are saying these things generally believe what they're saying? You know, so in the book, I specifically sort of tried to avoid ascribing intent. I, to be honest, now that it's a year or so out, I, I actually sort of regret that decision. <laughs> I, I think it's very hard to say that they're not doing it on purpose. I, I talk about a few things in the book where th- there's an error I call the loss in translation, where you know some bit of scientific information gets really just mangled along the way from one source to another. There is a chance that the person talking about that really doesn't understand how that happened. That and so okay, fine, you know. But even though the politicians themselves are not experts, as they are so willing to tell us, that doesn't mean they aren't surrounded by experts and you know a very willing internet to, to right. help them to help them figure things out at any moment you know there's no reason for elected officials to not have the best available information at their fingertips so if they don't then it means that they're trying to avoid it you know they're they're either you know, sort of kowtowing to moneyed interest to fossil fuel companies or to pharmaceutical companies or to whatever it is, or they're just sort of pandering to a base that they know is sort of in favor of one policy or or another. So yeah, I mean, I think for the most part, it's very hard to say any of this is an accident. All right, Joe, what do you think? 
I like this interview. I like listening to what Dave has to say. I almost wish he spent more time on oversimplification Mm. because I think that is a huge problem in American politics. Yeah. With anything, with net neutrality, with climate change and with immigration. And I'll take climate change as an example. On one end, you have people screaming and yelling that there is no climate change, nothing's happening. On the other end, you have people screaming that we're all going to die in 50 years because of climate change. Okay. Right? These are extreme views. Neither one of them is correct. There is something in the middle, somewhere very far from these two extreme views, maybe closer to one end than the other, that is actually the fact. And we can't get to it as the populace because there's too much noise going on and too much oversimplification of it. Right. And the reason for that is because we as people don't have the time to sit down and try to understand these issues, hmm. right? We're busy, right? Yeah, I, I would say that, you know, we need to do a better job at uh, teaching people critical thinking. And, I would agree uh, with that 100%. You know, and how to, and yeah. his point on scientific literacy is is, is absolutely accurate. Yeah. We really do need better scientific literacy in this country. I'll even go farther and say we need better mathematic literacy in this country hmm. as well, okay. because that promotes logical thinking and decomposition and things of that nature. Yeah, I find it interesting that he says that people in power want to trick and deceive you to gain, you know, and of course the end game is to gain more power. And I'm like, well, yeah, (laughs) don't trust these people, hold them accountable, watch them, communicate with them and ding them when they can. You know, the the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. Right. I would disagree with with Dave about his statement that politicians are surrounded by experts. That's true. But they also have a very willing Internet to support them. I don't think politicians should pay very much attention to the internet. I think that's a very bad idea. It's a great place for people to feed you misinformation and wrong information. And we've seen that coming to light in recent years. Politicians are not immune from the same kind of manipulation that the populace falls victim to. Yeah, it's an interesting change in the way information is both gathered and disseminated. Right. And it's never verified. Yeah. So I don't think looking at people on the internet for your scientific stuff, I don't mean don't get papers off the internet, read papers on the internet. That's what you should be doing, but have your experts do that and have them go to verified sources. Yeah. Be careful with your sources. And peer reviewed journals are a big thing. Very important. There was a recent study. I can't remember where I saw this, but somebody wrote a complete and total bogus article and published it in a journal that you pay to publish articles in and news outlets picked up on it Mm -hmm. because he put out press releases and it was an experiment in how he can take something that looks like it's scientific and promote it, but it's complete and total bunk. Right. From front to back. Yeah, interesting. I'll have to look more into that one. That actually might be a good story for later in this hacking humans because <laughs> it's a pretty good social engineering experiment. Yeah, yeah. And finally, when when Dave was talking about a lack of shame, that people have a lack of shame, I don't think that's what the issue is. I don't think that people have a lack of shame. I think what they've gained instead of losing shame is the ability to avoid shame huh. by living in their own echo chambers. This is why I say don't get your political news from Facebook. Don't do it. Because there's been studies in in a Wall Street Journal article about what your timeline looks like based on your political affiliation. Facebook wants you to look at things. They want you to look at their website. So they're not going to show you things that make you angry and turn it off. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you stay in an echo chamber of your own beliefs. And that's what happens with this shame. So you you, you say something on Facebook and people who are like-minded like you come in and go, yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. And nobody ever will challenge you on it. Right. right. So probably because they don't see it. So you're not, you're not getting called out. Right. Like you would in you're, a, you're not in getting a, called in the public out. square. I think that's a really good point. All right. Well, thanks to uh, Dave Levitan for joining us. Again, the book is Not a Scientist, How Politicians Mistake, Misrepresent, and Utterly Mangle Science. We appreciate him coming on and spending time with us. That is our podcast. We want to thank our sponsor, Know Before, whose new school security awareness training will help you keep your people on their toes with security at the top of their mind. Stay current about the state of social engineering by subscribing to their Cyber Heist News at Know Before. Before.com slash news. Think of no before for your security training. Thanks to the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute for their participation. You can learn more about them at isi.jhu.edu. The Hacking Humans podcast is proudly produced in Maryland at the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our coordinating producer is Jennifer Iben. Our editor is John Petrick. Technical editor is Chris Russell. Executive editor is Peter Kilpie. I'm Dave Bittner. And I'm Joe Kerrigan. Thanks for listening. 